Today on Blue 58, there are a lot of interesting defensive line prospects in this year's draft, which should be good news for the Packers, because they definitely need some help up front. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode, and especially happy because it's been a while. I think this is the longest we've been off in a couple of years. And I just got to apologize for kind of getting out of the flow of things with uh, with getting episodes out. We have had some sickness at our house. Three out of the four people that live in our house got sick. The only person who didn't was me. But that doesn't do a whole lot as far as the podcast recording schedule uh, when everybody else is not doing too well. And it sounds weird to say this, but it's annoying that it wasn't even the ongoing global pandemic or whatever stage we're at with that that hit our house. Just normal run-of-the-mill cold knocked us all out for like a week and a half. So that's why things have been delayed. But I have a lot of things to talk about with this defensive line class because I think there is a lot of really interesting talent in this class. Very few what I would describe as perfect fits, both with where the Packers are going to play or be picking and where the Packers are likely going to end up needing them to play. But I think there's a pretty solid amount of talent in this class. We're going to lean heavily on the mock draft database again. According to their consensus big board, there are 20 defensive line prospects in the top 200. Eight of them are considered top 100 guys. Compared to previous seasons, that's a bit more than usual. 2022, for instance, only had 16 uh, players in the top 200, seven in the top 100. And it's been roughly around that number back until 2019. That's the only year in the past five or so where there's been more talent toward the top on the defensive line. 21 players in the top 200 that year, 14 in the top 100. Of note, I have taken a couple of the guys out of consideration of those 20 in the top 200 because I think they're edge rushers, not defensive linemen. For instance, Tuli Tulo Palo Tu from USC. I know I did not pronounce his last name right, but you know what? He didn't hit the thresholds as an edge rusher or a defensive lineman, so I don't have to learn how to pronounce his name unless the Packers draft him. So I'm not going to bother putting that into my brain. Mike Morris from Michigan is the other one. They're just not going to be among our players that we discussed this year because they didn't fit what we were looking for among the edge rushers, and we missed them when we were we changed the methodology a little bit. I don't think they're defensive linemen, so we're just going to just put them on the shelf uh, for right now. I think they could both be interesting players. They're promising in their own rights. They're just not going to, to be a part of our discussion, even though they are among the consensus mock drafts, top 200 players. So what are we looking for among these guys anyway? Basically, I think we want athletic pass rushers, and I know that run defense is part of the part of the skill set that you need as a defensive lineman. I get that, and it's a big part of you know the evaluation process. But I don't think there's a really good way to evaluate run defense for college guys, even if you're sitting down and watching all of the film, because just the the physicality of the game and the scheme of the game is going to be so much different at the NFL level than it is at the college level. I think you're better off just putting all of your evaluation eggs, at least for our purposes, at this podcast, just an amateur level looking at guys in the draft, putting all your evaluation eggs in the pass rushing basket and going from there with the understanding that, yeah, a lot of these guys might struggle against the run, but a lot of young pass rushers struggle against the run anyway. Even Rashawn Gary here in year three or four is still figuring out the best way to play against the run, and he's a wonderfully talented edge rushing prospect who would have been a defensive lineman by a lot of different measures coming out of the draft. It's it's just hard for some guys to play the run because a lot of times they don't have to because rushing the passer is the more valuable skill set. So we're going to focus on that part of that. We want athletes, so a relative athletic score of eight or better, a production ratio, so sacks and tackles for loss per game of 0.75 or better. And then I want you to get uh, a pressure on 10% or better of your pass rushes. We'll tell you how all these guys break down among the guys in the top 100. Then I'll give you a few interesting facts about the guys that fall between 100 and 200. I also want to try something new. I'm going to throw out one, maybe not 
necessarily germane to how they are going to perform as a player, but just one interesting fact about each of these guys as well. So that brings us to the very tip top of the draft class this year. And we have to go all the way to the top when we start our defensive lineman conversation, because Jalen Carter out of Georgia is number five on the consensus mock draft big board. Six foot three, 314 pounds out of Georgia, no testing data, just resting on his film. And it's some pretty solid stuff for Mr. Carter out of Georgia. He's got a production ratio of 0.7 for his career uh, as a Bulldog, a pressure rate of 9.91 or percent, 9.91 percent. Just a really, really solid player. Does not meet the thresholds that we talk about, but uh, adjusting for the Georgia curve, he's right there. He's a blue chip prospect through and through. He's been in and around the conversation among the very best football players in the country since he was in high school. A five-star recruit out of high school, he appeared in 10 games as a freshman for Georgia, won two national titles with Georgia in an increasingly big role, caps off his time there as a 2022 Associated Press, Football Writers Association of America, Walter Camp, and Sporting News All-America First Teamer. He is a decorated football player for his college career. The productivity is there. The play strength is there. It's not all to the thresholds that we look for. It's right there. He's a very, very good player. Was great in Georgia. He he is rightly in the conversation when you look at the totality of who he is as as a player in the top 10, probably top five as a prospect. If not for his pre-draft process, his time between ending his college career and the NFL draft has been about as bad as as I can really recall for any prospect. He didn't test at the Combine, whatever, that happens. There were some extenuating circumstances as to why he did not test. Some of the off-field stuff that we'll talk about here in a second prevented him from taking part in the Combine, may not have done a whole lot there anyway. But then he shows up at his pro day. He looks like he's sleepwalking. This kind of thing can get overstated. I would encourage you to look up some video of Jalen Carter's pro day Even to an untrained eye, he does not look physically right. He looks like he rolled out of bed 15 minutes before the pro day was supposed to start. Not moving well, I think is how you would would really put it. But that's hardly even the bad part, unfortunately. He left the scene of a street racing crash earlier this year in which a Georgia football player was killed. He does not appear to have been impaired during that crash, even though someone, some other people involved in the situation were drinking. He does not appear to have been Uh, And that was not ultimately part of the the punishment that he received, but he did leave the scene. He was later charged with reckless driving and street racing. I don't think this is an he's off our board character type thing. That's just my personal evaluation of it. It's not great. And it does give you some sort of pause on the decision-making process there. But the Packers, for that matter, took Devontae Wyatt last year, and he had some similar sorts of concerns, some situations involving a gun. So I think arguably even worse. And I think this is the kind of thing where you don't even have to weigh in on it all that much. You don't have to, you know, really make big declarative statements about, like, what this says about him as a person. I think it kind of just speaks for itself. He was in a bad situation. He put himself in a bad situation, and it has clearly affected him pre-draft. Interesting facts on Mr. Carter. He was a basketball player and weightlifter in high school, and with a 395-pound bench press in the high school state final, in, I think, Class 2A in Georgia. He placed second in his class. 395 pounds. Good for second place. What did the other guy do? Pretty crazy. But he has always been a strong guy, and uh, that is a big part of his game. Should probably still go in the top 10, I would think, for sure. I kind of get the sense that all the stuff about uh, his pre-draft process is stuff that teams are going to set aside, ultimately. It isn't great. It has been pretty bad for him pre-draft, but I think if you look at what he's done on the field, people are going to look past that and say this is probably just a phase and he'll come out of it eventually. Not to uh, to downplay the seriousness of the situation in which, again, he put himself, uh, but I think they, they're going to say this is a, a thing that was a the action of an immature young man. And we'll hope that he becomes a more mature, very solid football player down the road for whatever team ends up drafting him. Second defensive lineman comes after a bit of a drop here. 
Brian Brisey out of uh, out of Clemson is 23, 23rd on the consensus big board. 6'5 and a half, 298 pounds, a relative athletic score of 958. Career production ratio, 0.96, so more than clears that threshold. And a career pressure percentage of 9.84. Not quite to the 10% threshold there, but very, very close. To me, Breezy looks like the sort of guy who who had the sort of career that a guy like Jalen Carter would have had if he was the top dog the whole way through his career. So Carter had to deal with uh, being on the same defensive line as Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt at Georgia, among many other talented prospects on that defense. We've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years talking about the many skilled defensive players that Georgia's had, and that does affect some of their statistical output. Breezy is not that sort of guy. He did not have to deal with the same otherworldly talent level across the board that Georgia has had at Clemson, not to take anything away from where Clemson has been. They've been a very, very solid football program, but not quite to the talent level of Georgia. He also was a very highly ranked recruit coming out of high school, an instant starter for Clemson, very productive career, even as a largely interior rusher. If you're looking at things to like about Breezy, size, athleticism, production, he's fractional points away from being a pure tier one prospect. He's just a really, really good player. However, he has also had quite a few injuries, only played 25 games over three years at Clemson. That, I'd say, is by far the biggest red flag for him. He is also said to be a little bit unrefined as a pass rusher, which, yes, is probably true. But I think that's also true of a lot of college pass rushers. Almost anybody who is putting up elite production numbers, you'll see that people will criticize their refinement as a pass rusher. It happens a lot with guys that are just tremendous athletes because why would you go through all the trouble of developing an elite pass rush package if nine out of 10 games you are just going to be vastly more athletic than the guy you are rushing against? Why bother? And that happens at a lot of different positions in college football. Guys don't end up learning the finer points of the position because they simply just do not have to. And that, I think, is important to remember as you look at all of these prospects pre-draft. Every one of these guys is going to be a little bit of a work in progress, so you want to look for the guys who can take the next step in the NFL. Breezy might be that sort of guy. As a high school basketball player, he averaged 13.7 points per game and 11.9 rebounds as a junior. So stick that in the, that in the back of your mind. People love to talk about basketball bra- backgrounds. Breezy's got one. Our third defensive line prospect is Kalijah Kansi out of Pittsburgh, 24th on the overall big board. Six foot one, 281 pounds, a relative athletic score of 9.6, and the production numbers, well, you got 11. 1.53 production ratio, 12.41 pressure percentage for his career. He's been a fixture at Pittsburgh over the last three seasons. After he redshirted in 2019, his first year on campus, he was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year in 2022, the second Pitt player to do that after Aaron Donald, to whom he gets compared quite a bit. And we'll talk about that here in a second. If you're talking about what to like about Cansey, insanely productive. Production ratio and pressure percentage are first and second, respectively, among all of the defensive linemen in my list. Very, very good athlete. In terms of the getting the job done part of the evaluation prospect process, Cansey checks every possible box. He just does great work. Even though he's a little bit on the smaller side, he gets after the quarterback, he's aggressive, he is just a wildly productive interior pass rusher. The problem, I think, is that he might not actually be a defensive lineman. Size is a very real concern, and this is where we have to pick at the Aaron Donald comparisons a little bit. Donald is a short defensive lineman. That point has been belabored to a great extent over the life of his NFL career. But Cansey is small in different ways than Donald is. I've never really been a big arm length guy, but Cansey has uniquely short arms, almost two full inches shorter than Aaron Donald. In fact, it might actually be two full inches shorter than Aaron Donald. Only about 30 inches long, which is really short. Add that to a guy who's already on the smaller side, and I think you may have a real problem here. But I think it is a solvable one, and I don't think I would try to force him to stay on the defensive line because I think he might actually be an edge rusher. He compares really well athletically to Melvin Ingram, another shorter pass rusher who played on the line in college, then bumped outside playing on the edge 
in the NFL. And I think this is probably a case where you see a really talented player and you have to work a little bit to find him a role that makes sense in the NFL. But if you are willing to put in the work and be patient, you may be rewarded if you can find that right spot and do the work, provided that Cansey is willing to do the work as well. And why wouldn't he? If you have the chance to make real NFL edge rusher money, say, look here, if you, you could be an average defensive lineman or you could potentially be an elite edge rusher and get paid like an elite edge rusher, that would change my mind. I'm not proud enough <laughs> as what I'm doing. You know, say somebody is like, well, you can make okay money as a podcaster, but if you wanted to say, like, narrate really boring audiobooks, you could make a billion times more money. Shoot, I like podcasting a lot, but the money probably talks in that scenario. Maybe that's the sort of way to, to really sell a position switch to a guy like Cansey. You could really have a chance to have a super productive, big-time career on the edge. Cansey, for your interesting fact about him, is an or was an administrative of justice, administration of justice major at Pittsburgh, which is one of the cooler-sounding majors that I have ever heard of. Continuing down the list, we have to talk about a very different kind of prospect in Mozzie Smith out of Michigan. He is 37th on the overall consensus big board, six foot three, 323 pounds. No testing data for him so far other than bench press, and we will talk about his bench press here in a second. Production ratio, just 0.22 for his college career. Pressure percentage, 6.81. Not a big pass rusher, but he is big in other ways. He came along pretty slowly at Michigan, played two games as a freshman, five as a sophomore, then 14 games, and 14 games as a junior and senior, starting all 28 of those games over the past two years. If you are in need of a nose tackle, Mr. Smith is your guy. Big at 323 pounds, very, very strong. You may have heard of Bruce Feldman's freaks list. Well, here's what Bruce Feldman had to say about Mozzie Smith. Quote, let's start with this. Smith does 22 reps on the bench press. But that's with 325, not 225 pounds. He close grip benched 550 pounds. He vertical jumps 44 inches. He broad jumped 9, 4 and a half. Smith, who had 37 tackles last season, his junior season, has clocked a 4, 4, 1 short shuttle time, which would have tied the best by any defensive tackle at this year's NFL scouting combine. And it would have been better than any defensive tackle weighing 310 pounds or more in the past decade. His 6.953 cone time would have been the best by far among defensive tackles in Indianapolis. The fastest was 7.33 seconds. Smith's 60-yard shuttle time is 11.9 seconds. Now, he did not do a lot of that testing at the Combine, out of the quote now, but he did do the bench press and put up 34 reps at 225 pounds, which I think we can consider a relatively slow day for him. He is very much a nose tackle. He does not offer much from a pass rush perspective. I do not think the Packers are probably interested in the scope in which they would have to, uh, or in the area in which they would probably have to pick him. You're probably looking at a second round, early third round pick, if you know, depending on what you think of uh, taking a, a nose tackle, a fairly limited nose tackle early in the draft on day two, maybe. But he's he's probably going to to be very good in that role as long as you have appropriate expectations for him. I'll throw one more uh, athletic feat at you for him for Mr. Smith's uh, interesting fact here. Back to Bruce Feldman. Quote, The Wolverines do what's called a reactive plyo stairs test, which is a series of seven 26-inch high stairs that players attempt to jump up as fast as possible. The team record is 2.21 seconds. Smith did it in 2.82 seconds. And to better gauge just how impressive that is, Aiden Hutchinson, some 60 pounds lighter than Smith, did it in 2.57 seconds, end quote. Our next defensive line prospect should be very familiar to fans who root for the Packers and Badgers. We're talking about Keanu Benton out of Wisconsin. He's 57th on the overall consensus big board. Six foot three and six eighth, six eighths inches tall. Six three and three quarters, let's put it that way. 309 pounds, a relative athletic score of 8.87. Career production ratio of 0.72, so just narrowly below the threshold there but a career pressure percentage of 10.3%. He's a Wisconsin guy through and through. From Janesville in South Central Wisconsin, went to Wisconsin after also getting some recruiting attention from Iowa. He is productive, very nearly a pure Tier 1 prospect. 
narrowly misses on production ratio, also played pretty consistently uh, at different spots on the defensive line. Some nose tackle work, some three-tech defensive tackle work. I don't honestly think there's anything not to like about Benton. It's just a matter of getting value with a guy like him. You're not going to take him in the first round, you would think. Early in the second round is still probably too high, but like right in that maybe like 40 to 55 range, you could really see a guy like Benton coming off the board. Since even if he is a good defensive line prospect, he's not playing a super premium position like an edge rusher. If you had a comparable guy athletically and with the production that Benton had on the edge, he would be for sure a first round pick. He's just not quite there yet. And I think he's still kind of a work in progress, having played around a lot on the defensive line. He hasn't really found a home. So people may not be entirely sure what to do with him yet either. So I think there's a little bit of that that goes into Benton's evaluation here too. People aren't just aren't quite sure what he is yet. That's okay. He's got time to figure it out. Uh, I think he's going to be a really good pro though. It seems like he is still on the way up uh, and someone who gets him is going to have a chance to make him into something really, really interesting in the NFL. Interesting fact on Benton, 48-2 and two career record as a heavyweight wrestler in high school. Speaking of heavyweights, doesn't get much heavier than Siaki Ika out of Baylor. 58th on the overall consensus big board. 6'2 and 7'8, 335 pounds. Just a plugger. 268 relative athletic skill, relative athletic score, excuse me. 0.41 production ratio, 8.57% uh, career pressure percentage, though. Uh, committed to BYU originally. He is from Utah, then decided to go to LSU was there for a couple years, then transferred to Baylor, where he was a big force on their defensive line. And not just as a a size pun there, he put up some pretty impressive numbers at times at Baylor. Not consistently, but the overall statistical body of work is pretty solid for a guy who's very much a nose tackle. And that is what he is. If you want a big nose tackle, Siaki Ika is a big nose tackle, and that is pretty much it. His athleticism numbers... Straight up bad at the combine. He didn't bench. The movement skills were bad. Did not run well. He is pretty much just a line holder. Though the he did accumulate some numbers at times. Uh, I think he had four sacks in one season at Baylor as pretty much a pure nose. Overall, just 10.5 tackles for loss, 4.5 sacks in his career. 3.5 of those sacks came in one season. There you have it. It wasn't four. It was 3.5. If you're looking for a nose tackle, he is a nose tackle. Your value of that position is going to determine a lot of where you would even want to take him. I can tell you that his nickname is Apu. I don't know how that factors into your evaluation, but according to his official Baylor uh, bio, that is his name or nickname. Heading down to Florida for prospect number 70 on the overall consensus big board for Jervon Dexter out of Florida, 6'5 and 5 eighths, 310 pounds. A good athlete, 9.69 relative athletic score, but not super productive. A career production ratio of 0.43 and a pressure percentage of 8.03%. Wall-to-wall contributor at Florida, played 38 games over three seasons, including 12 as a freshman. Amazing, brilliant height-weight athleticism combo. Love the length. If you want a traitsy mid-round defensive lineman, I think this is probably your man. If you're looking for just the the raw athleticism and size that you hope to mold into something, Javon Dexter in, you know, like the third, fourth, fifth round is probably your guy. However, he never really married those traits into productivity in Florida. And I think you have to wonder about that. Just five sacks in 38 games. For comparison, Siaki Ika, four and a half in 37 Only 50 career pressures on 623 career pass rushes. For comparison, Siaki Ika, who we talked about as being a unathletic nose tackle who was basically a part-time player, he had 49 pressures in 572 rushes. If you are a world-class athlete like Dexter is, it is a little bit concerning when you're putting up production numbers that are similar to a guy who played nose tackle and is basically considered to not have had a very good combine at all. I mean, that's not even really an opinion. He just did not have a good combine. Uh, 
Interesting fact about Dexter, he ranked fourth in snaps played among Power 5 interior defensive linemen his final season in college. He averaged about 65 snaps per game in 2022. If you're looking for one possible explanation for why he did not uh, produce at a super high level, that could be one. Maybe he just got a little bit worn down from what they needed him to do at Florida. Just throwing out a possible reason there. Finally, and I know we said we were only going to do the top 100, but Zach Pickens out of South Carolina is at 109, is close enough. I kind of wanted to talk about him just because there are two C's in Zach, Z-A-C-C-H. That was new to me, but apparently not all that common, at least according to the Pro Football Focus draft database. There have been a few, a handful of guys named Zach with two C's. That could be because his full name is Zacchaeus Pickens, but this Zacchaeus is not a wee little man. Six foot three and seven eighths, 291 pounds. Like Dexter, good athleticism, 9 2 relative athletic score. Like Dexter, not a terrible or not a terribly productive uh, career in college. 0.44 production ratio, 4.6% pressure rate, just not good numbers. Four year contributor, though, at South Carolina after enrolling early for his freshman year. I'm always amazed by guys who can do that. Literally a teenager going against guys with multiple years of high level college football experience. Not for nothing, he consistently posted very good grades. He has already graduated with his degree. Uh, if you're looking for a guy with a work ethic, with who's willing to put in the time and the effort to get stuff done, it seems like Pickens is willing to do that kind of work. And I know you do have to grade on a little bit of a curve, you know, no pun intended, with you know college athletes and, and some of their GPA and their classroom accomplishments and things like that. But Pickens seems to be the real deal. It looks to me like a slightly shorter Jervin Dexter, Jervon Dexter. All the traits in the world, a bit lighter, lots of experience, similarly unproductive. Maybe a little bit of a roll issue that is possible, but 11 and a half tackles for loss, just seven and a half sacks and 43 career games is not great. As far as interesting facts go, this is barely a Zach Pickens fact, but it was so good I had to include it anyway. He was named at South Carolina a 2022, the 2022, one of the 2022 Rex Enright team captains. Now, I thought this was just an endowed award or something that some big donor to the college had named after them, which is becoming more common. You'll see now a lot of times uh, college football coaches have their coaching positions named after a wealthy donor who is essentially probably paying their salary or at least part of their salary to have that position named after them. And I thought that was the case here. It's the, it's the Rex Ren, Enright team captain position. Somebody named Rex Enright gave a whole bunch of money to South Carolina, and that's how he got the job. But that is not what has happened. Rex Enright is a former head coach at South Carolina. And in addition to coaching at South Carolina, Enright also spent one season coaching the Georgia Pre-Flight Skycrackers, which was a team of Navy football players that was active during World War II. So I had to include that for the team name alone. During the 1943 season, they played a bunch of college teams like Clemson and Tulane, but they also played other service teams such as the North Carolina pre-flight Cloudbusters. So there is a Zach Pickens fact that is not really about Zach Pickens at all, but got me to look into some behind-the-scenes stuff about why team names are what they are and how team names work and learned a little bit about World War II service era football. How's that for some bonus information on this here podcast. Before we talk about prospects uh, between 100 and 200, I did want to give some Patreon shout outs to James Schluter, Frank Ziegler, and Jeff Moreno, all patrons for about a year now, uh, each of them generously supporting the Power Sweep and Blue 58, starting their journey to that by heading over to the powers or patreon.com slash the power sweep. And if that is something that you've been considering doing now is a really good time because we do a lot of interesting draft talk in that discord server. And this is a great time to get in on that. There are some really sharp draft people in the power sweeps community. And I would encourage you, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, come hang out with those people. Even I learn quite a bit about the pre-draft process. We get a lot of discussion about guys that may not have necessarily been on my radar, but maybe worth knowing about anyway. So give it a listen. Check it out. I hope you will really enjoy it. Uh, join the community uh, on our Discord server, and that's one of the chief benefits of heading to patreon.com slash thepowersweep and joining our 
Patreon effort there. Okay, prospects between 100 and 200. Really, 110 and 200 because Zach Pickens was at 109, but I think you get it there. Uh, Jacqueline Roy out of LSU is prospect number 110. Six foot three, 305 pounds, cracked 10% on pass rush percentage or pressure percentage. Not a bad prospect there by any means, but um, like all of these guys between 100 and 200, they all have individual warts, which we'll not dive into individually all that much. But uh, just know that there's a reason that they've slid down the the board this far. However, I think there are some interesting guys in this mix. For instance, Carl Brooks out of Bowling Green, prospect number 116. One of my favorite guys to watch in this pre-draft process so far. You don't see a lot of guys at or near 300 pounds rushing from a stand-up position as much as he did. But he did it at, uh, at Bowling Green. I think in the NFL, he probably ends up being like a more traditional 4-3 defensive end or something like that, maybe even a three-technique defensive tackle. But in college, even rushing from the outside, even standing up as a pass rusher, which again, for a guy close to 300 pounds, is uh, is an interesting thing to see. And he moves pretty well, though his testing numbers at the Combine didn't show it. He put up a production ratio of 1.5, a, a career pass rush pressure percentage of 13.79%. Pretty interesting prospect, I think, here in like late third round, fourth round, fifth round, something like that. Byron Young out of Alabama is prospect number 117. I think I'd probably just give him a miss and because he's not super productive, didn't test or don't have testing numbers on him. He may be where he's at on this list just because of where he went to college. People figure he might be a little bit better than he probably is. Kobe Turner out of Wake Forest uh, is prospect number 129. Moved really well at his pro day. Has great size overall. If we got full testing numbers on him, he might be in tier one because of the athleticism there. Because the productivity is there too. A 0.92 career production ratio, 10.9 or 10.3 percent pressure rate. Just a, it seems like seems like a pretty solid prospect who moves pretty well, has pretty good size. If the Packers took a flyer on him uh, on day three of the draft, I would not be opposed at all. A lot of the people I know are really excited about Moro Ajomo out of Texas, 136 or prospect number 136 on the consensus big board, 944 relative athletic score, only 21 years old and a relatively freshly minted 21 as well. He played five years of college football, which if you're doing the math, meant that he enrolled there when he was about 16. Well, that is the case. Uh, Because of how they do high school a little bit different in Nigeria, which is where he grew up, he got to Texas early, was able to play five years of college football, now still a very much ascending prospect and a terrific athlete on top of that. So if you're interested in waiting a couple years for him to develop into something that more than just a, a great athlete, he might be someone you're interested in. Keandre Coburn out of Texas is prospect number 148. He too Fairly interesting. 6'1", 336 pounds, a career pressure rate of 12%. That's pretty unusual for a guy who's 336 pounds. That did come in pretty limited reps, though. Just 231 career pass rush snaps, according to Pro Football Focus. But still, 12%. Nothing to sneeze at. Staying down in the southern portion of the country, Jalen Redmond out of Oklahoma is prospect number 179. Solid late round profile, 6'2", 291 pounds, 785 relative athletic score, 1.42 production production ratio, 11.97% pressure rate. Not too shabby there for Mr. Redmond out of Oklahoma. Jumping over to Oklahoma State, we've got Tyler Lacey at number 190 on the big board, 8.48 relative athletic score. 0.96 0.96 production ratio. I think he might be an edge rusher. Just 279 pounds, fairly light for a defensive lineman. You might be looking at another, maybe like poor man's Kalijah Kansi there. And rounding things out, uh, we've got one more big plugger on our list here with Jared Clark out of Coastal Carolina, prospect number 198 on the consensus big board. Six foot three, 334 pounds, another nose option if you are in the market for one of those. So there you have it. I think if the Packers are looking to spend capital on a defensive lineman, it's probably not going to be in the first round. If you're looking for somebody in the front seven in the first round where the Packers are picking, it's probably going to be an edge rusher, and they're probably going to need somebody to fall to them. But if you're looking for more of a true defensive lineman, I think there's an abundance of options in like the second through fifth round 
Sure, they all come with some warts. Maybe they're a little bit raw. Maybe they're a little bit small. Maybe they weren't quite as productive. You can have, it seems like you can have size, athleticism, or productivity, uh, but you get to pick like two of the three at most if you're picking outside the first round, especially this year. Uh, And even as we talk about Kalijah Kansi, maybe even in the first round, you may not get all three of those things. However, the Packers do have a big need on the defensive lineman. Right now, they've got Kenny Clark, they've got Devontae White, and they've got TJ Slayton, and that's about it as far as defensive line talent right now. They're going to need more than that. They haven't signed anybody yet. Unless you're counting on an unusually big leap from somebody like Chris Slayton or Jonathan Ford, you're going to just need some bodies there. So I think the Packers do need to take a defensive lineman, and I think, hopefully, as I've laid out here, There are some interesting options, again, as I said, in the second through fifth round. We'll see who it ends up being. I'm optimistic that there are some really interesting talents here at all levels of the draft, but especially where the Packers are probably going to be looking to take a defensive lineman. And we'll see here in just about three weeks what ends up happening. In the meantime, that's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I would appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it that's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.